Hi, and welcome to the Discourse Collective. Now, if you've ever stared up at the night sky, perhaps watching for those patterns of stars or hoping to see a comet, you've probably wondered where it all comes from. Some of the biggest questions we can ask ourselves all start with, where did the universe come from? So today, the Discourse Collective is asking that same question. Now, for such a big question, it's very hard to know where to start. In the spirit of intellectual honesty, we have to consider three main avenues – science, philosophy and religion. Each of them comes at that problem from a different direction, and each provides some very useful food for thought about how we might start answering this same question. We also need to prepare ourselves. For this conversation to make sense, we have to use some words that are packed with preconceptions. Things like evidence, proof, logic and belief. They all have a place at the table here, and they all come fully loaded with a side order of difficult concepts. Before we tackle that, though, let's start with something that I hope that we can all agree on. If someone tells you that they know how the universe started, and I mean really knows, then they're lying. Not just some vague ideas like the Big Bang or it was God, but really knows. What did it look like? Where did it come from? What was there before? Any attempt to understand how the universe came into existence must be conducted with the expectation that we're going to be dealing with some best guesses, not absolutes. So with that warning ringing firmly in our ears, let's continue. No, wait, actually, hang on. First off, we'd better cover some ground on proof. Well, and evidence. And while we're at it, let's try a little bit of reason and logic as well. But we're going to start with proof. So this is a slippery customer because it means different things to different people. The proof is the data that shows something is true. Note that it's a noun and not a verb. It's a thing and not an action. For some people, the fact that the Earth can be seen via a live video feed to be round from space is proof that we live on a globe. For others, it isn't. For some, the materialistic data from biology is proof of evolution, and for others, it isn't. Now, we've covered conspiracy theories in a different video, and this isn't that. This is not about an alternative narrative. It's about the perception of reality. If you and I disagree on something, uh, and whether or not it's true, I can try to provide you with proof that I'm right. Now, you might accept that proof, or you might not. Your perception is your reality. Now, evidence is the type of thing that's presented as part of the process of proving a fact. That evidence could be a physical object, or it could be perhaps a logical statement of reason, or it could be a mathematical proof. Now, for some people, the Bible is evidence that God exists, and for others, it isn't. Just as with proof, people may accept it or dismiss it. Now, this raises an interesting question. What happens when you make a claim and then present evidence, and the other person doesn't accept it? If they make a fair refutation, then it's kind of back to you to go to the drawing board and rethink your point. However, if they simply won't accept it, then it's also kind of up to you just to really walk away and leave them to it. Logic comes into play when we are trying to show something to be true. When we want to provide a pointer towards a good hypothesis for something being true, or we just simply want to try to explain something from incomplete reasoning. Deductive reasoning is where we take two things that are known to be true. So for example, A equals B, B equals C, so it stands that A equals C. It's kind of like a chain. In the real world, it looks like this. All green-leaved plants contain chlorophyll, this plant is green-leaved, and so this plant contains chlorophyll. As long as the two premises that precede the conclusion are true, the conclusion is true. Watch out for incorrect premises. All dogs have four legs, this animal has four legs, this animal is a dog. No, it's not, it's a cat. These are category errors and are very common with deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is like building a picture using the very best data we have to hand. Now, as I walk along this row of trees, the first is an apple tree, the second is an apple tree, so is the third, so is the fourth. Now, inductive reasoning tells me that the fifth is also an apple tree. Now, in this case, it's true, but it could just as easily have been a pear tree. Inductive reasoning does not guarantee a correct conclusion, but it can help find patterns and build hypotheses. And now we move to abductive reasoning, and this sees us try to 
really find the likeliest explanation from an incomplete set of data. And we do this all the time in everyday life. You open the fridge or your milk has been used and your abductive reasoning tells you that your housemate got thirsty in the night and drank all the milk. Now this conclusion is not guaranteed by any means. Perhaps it was another house guest, but you're doing the very best you can with the information that you've got to hand. So back again. Now, how does this all relate to how the universe started? Remember I said that nobody could know for sure? Well, the best we can do here is present inductive logic or abductive logic. We can't use deductive reasoning because we don't actually have any facts that are known to be absolutely true. So what do we know for sure about the universe? Well, actually very little. We do know enough to make some good inductive reasoning attempts. We know, thanks in a large part to Edwin Hubble, uh, he showed that the universe is currently and most likely has been since its start expanding. It's been pushing outwards. What's more, the further galaxy is expanding faster than the nearer ones. Now, we can't use terms like center or edge here because since as far as we can tell, the universe doesn't actually have either a center or an edge. Now, we also know that there is a very nearly constant and uniform radiation called cosmic background radiation. Our current understanding is that, that it comes from an expansion of the very hot and dense early universe as it expanded and started to cool down. So we have these two inductive elements that are pointing us to the idea of a Big Bang. And by and large, this is where science kind of runs out. There are many useful hypotheses, such as bubble universes and string theory, but they are currently so close to a maths-only theory that they are more akin to magic than physics. Quantum theory continues to be very useful and offer useful models and predictions and even real-world advances in computing and communications. So it's here we must accept the limitation of theories and science. They are not proven. Rather, they are predictions and models. They allow us to observe more and more things correctly over time. Science doesn't deal in certainty. It deals in degrees of statistical confidence. And so we have to perhaps move to religious spheres here to help guide our understanding of how the universe started. And religion has got an awful lot to say on the subject, more than we might think. So the first famous, the most famous of these is the teleological argument. Now, the universe is seemingly designed, ordered and complex. Something more complex must have created that situation and God is more complex. And so it is shown that God created the universe. This is, as string theory and bubble universes are, more akin to magic than an actual explanation. The additional problem here is that we've also just kicked the problem down the road. If a complex thing needs a complex creator, who created this complex God? If we're happy to say that God didn't need a creator, then we can also logically say that the universe didn't need a creator. If God is outside our physical laws, such as time and space and matter and energy, then so too can bubble universes and superspace in string theory be outside of those physical constraints. To use a quaint English phrase, what's good for the goose is also good for the gander. What does this stalemate of inductive reasoning leave us with? Well, it leaves us with abduction. We can look at what's in front of us, the universe, and try to formulate a conclusion from what is basically incomplete data. Again, religion has plenty to say here. What of the statistically improbable, from the perspective of a life-positive universe, starting conditions of the universe? And the general stability of the universe for life? Doesn't that point abductively towards a creator? Well, now we need to start to look back to physics. So enter the weak and strong anthropic principles. Anthropic from the Greek for man or human states in various degrees that a universe that contains life must be suitable for life. To put that another way, one that was fine tuned for life would be able to sustain life so that that fine tuning could be observed. Now, yes, it's a tautology and yes, it's the same as saying it is what it is. But the point remains, if the bubble universe was true, we'd abductively expect there to be some, at least one universe, with these initial starting conditions. And it just so happens that's the universe in which we live. So we end up here, really, just as we began, unable to say with any real certainty how the universe began. But that's no bad thing. It's almost an impossible question to answer with our current state of knowledge. But hopefully, you've seen why you should be skeptical of people who tell you with 100% surety that they know exactly how this universe started, however that might be. 
What do you think? Do you have ideas about how the universe began? Please let us know in the comments below. I would love to hear more about your opinions on this. And remember, if you've enjoyed this video, please do like and subscribe below. Um, and I will see you next time on the Discourse Collective.